In the Bible, Paul explains that everyone has two bodies, a physical body and a spiritual body. Mediums use their spiritual bodies when they act as a communication bridge between the physical and spirit worlds. As a spirit speaks, mediums hear the information using the ears of their spiritual bodies, then repeat the information to other physical people. Mediumship is synonymous with the biblical term, gifts of the spirit. The focus of our show, Making Known the Unknown, is to provide knowledge through the use of Reverend Hewitt's mediumship and Sidney Schwartz's research. The Bible contains the history of psychic events, along with man-made doctrines created by priests centuries ago. This show will explore the untruths which the Bible entrenched into our society. By uncovering these untruths, we encourage people everywhere to think for themselves with a critical mind. Hello, and welcome to Making Known the Unknown. I'm your host, Tina Tarek, and with me are my guests, Sydney Schwartz, Bible researcher and middle school teacher from Hackensack, New Jersey. Welcome, Sydney. Hi, Tina. And Reverend Carl Hewitt, founder and pastor of Gifts of the Spirit Church and Medium. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. And welcome to our viewers. Today's show is titled Gifts of Prophecy. And this also is a new season of ours, which is titled, you may have noticed, Psychic Phenomena in the Bible. And shortly, we will get into exactly what that means. But as you know, what I like to do sometimes is pick out a few pieces of current events and kind of throw it on the table before the show starts to see what uh, Carl and Sydney think about that. And one of the things, and some of you viewers may have um, been watching this or saw this maybe about a week ago, was the issue of gay clergy in Australia. I was passing by a television screen, and I believe it was on CNN, and I noticed that there was this big to-do about what the uh, church leaders in Melbourne, Australia, were going to do with respect to the gay clergy, almost like a don't ask, don't tell policy. And um, it was very interesting because one of the uh, one of the people there, I actually found a quote from on the internet uh, with respect to the, the gay clergy in Australia. And um, this person's name is uh, Reverend Dean Drayton. And um, a couple of these quotes here, I, I want to share with our viewers if I, if I could. Um, and one of the things that he was saying uh, was that, um, and he's referring to the question of homosexuality in the church, that uh, the question, he says, is, is how the matter can be advanced further so that rather than only acknowledging that there are two points of view, people who are pro or con uh, gay clergy, uh, he said we now can take some specific steps forward. Um, he also mentioned, and I'll quote, the church has another issue to work with, and that is how do we understand scripture when scripture has some quite strong statements, he said. And then He'd also mentioned um, at some point that um, there are two different ways of interpreting scripture with respect to the question of homosexuality. And I know that uh, Sidney and Carl have been doing some research in this area. Um, and in addition to this uh, article that I quote, I found some very interesting uh, information with respect to the U.S. Catholic clergy uh, and a gay presence. So I thought, interesting uh, that they talk about it in Australia, but what about in the U.S.? And this uh, article is quoted from actually Catholic News, uh, their website. And this was uh, from a survey that was conducted last year that found 55% of priests saying that such a subculture, uh, which is a gay subculture we're talking about, existing clearly or probably in their diocese or religious institute, um, and 41% of the priests that a homosexual subculture, excuse me, clearly or probably existed in the seminaries that they attended. Um, of course, this survey was conducted by the Association for the Sociology of Religion. Um, it was a 2001 survey, and they surveyed 1,279 diocesan and religious order priests, both active and retired. 
the response rate was something about 70 percent, and then they also followed up with some uh, interviews, personal interviews. Um, another key piece of this was that the um, people who were interviewed uh, were not asked to divulge their own sexual orientation, simply what they were um, aware of from their experience where they worked. So with that, I wanted to throw that piece out um, to both Sydney and Carl and, and see what they think about that as far as uh, uh, that being uh, something that's being brought very close uh, to present day with respect to um, uh, priests and homosexuality. Who wants to start? Well, um, currently this summer I'm working on finishing the book called Crossovers and part of the chapters deal with, with the scripture and how, how it's been interpreted. Um, and specifically, the, the Hebrew words that are used in where it says that a man shouldn't lie with a man because it's an abomination, that word in Hebrew is toiva. And it, the correct translation would be it's idolatrous. And that's because there was, there was homosexual sex rights that were practiced in other religions, which were considered quite normal in, the, in that society. Um, but the Hebrews didn't want any part of, of that foreign culture being coming into their religion. So that's why they were so against it and that's why they talked about it so negatively uh, all, all the time. Um, so that, as far as scripture goes, the scholars that I've been, been reading uh, this summer are, have continuously come to the conclusion that the Bible doesn't really condemn homosexuality. It condemns uh, stri uh, straight men having gay sex, uh, but it never really talks about two men in a committed, loving relationship, because that that whole that whole construct didn't exist in biblical times. Because every, every every male got married and had children, whether or not he was doing anything else on on the side, because because children in those days was like social security is today. They would they supported the, they supported you when you were old, and if you didn't have children, there'd be nobody to take care of you. So it, 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 the whole society was set, was set, up, was set up differently. And as, as far as, as so many of the priests being homosexual, um, the Awan, who was the, um, the ascended master who speaks through Carl when he's in trance, he, he came through and, and explained to us that because the, the, uh, the, gay, the gay male in ancient times was a medium, mediums were uh, the most homosexual most gay ma uh, mediums were homosexual and because they have a female soul and a male body and that, that, bo that a blending of the polarity makes, makes it very easy to speak with God. Mm -hmm. With the spirit world that Jesus says God is spirit mm -hmm. and God is both male and female despite what, what's in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's, it's a co combination of both. Therefore, the person who has both the positive and negative charge uh, or, or male and female charge with, within their soul and body uh, tends to be able to be in communication with those in the spirit world much easier. Mm -hmm. And because, the, because in, the, in the late 390s, when, when a mediumship was abandoned and, and thrown out of the church, these people came back and they still felt that they were supposed to be the intermediaries between God and the people. And the only place to fill that role after Jerome created his, uh, his reform was to be part of the priesthood. And that's why there's an affinity for, some, for, for, for many homosexual men to join the clergy because in their soul they have this feeling just like some kids are born and they, can, they take a few piano lessons and, and, and can play wonderfully because in a past life they've used to play the piano or they used to, or used to be a painter or they, they had some talent that comes back from it from another life. It's the same thing, it's called soul memory. And, and this, this is one reason why some, so many homo homosexual people are, are drawn to the clergy. Because at one point they were a medium in another life and they were the intermediaries, intermediaries between God and the people. So this is where the word having the knack comes from, right? Yes, that's right. Having the knack of mm -hmm. doing certain things. It's all memory. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So what it? you're saying is really this is not a surprise to either one of you. No, not at all. And it sounds like your research really uh, corroborates this. Yes. It yeah. really backs this up. And this will all be in the book and crossovers. Okay. Yes. So the timing is, is very good here. Yes. It would appear. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, for that comment. Okay. Um, with that, we're going to get into the topic of today's show, which is prophecy, the gift of prophecy. Um, and the first thing I'm going to ask is why is prophecy a gift? What, what is meant by the gift of prophecy? 
who wants to start with that? Maybe Carl could do that. Well, actually, if you go in the Bible, as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of books out there dealing with uh, psychic phenomena, prophecy, that type of thing. And uh, there's so many people who think that uh, the word prophecy and psychic and all of that belongs everywhere else except in the Bible. But yet the Bible is the greatest book, as far as I'm concerned, that covers all of this. Hmm. But yet you mentioned the Bible and psychic phenomena. So many people think that the word psychic belongs to the devil or some yeah. evil being, and yet the Bible is the greatest history book, as far as I'm concerned, dealing with that. And uh, they're wrong thinking that way because uh, when this guy crossed my path in 1977, as well as so many others, and I got them studying the Bible, I mean, they were blown away to think that there's so much of it in that book, you see? One of my students, he knows him very well, he was in my classes for years, and uh, I think he was Catholic, wasn't he? I think so. Uh, he was a great speaker, and I was uh, called away to a funeral out of state. And while I was gone, I asked him if he would take over the service one time. And when I got back, I found out that in his address to, you know, his lecture to the students, his lecture was that he feels that uh, in the spiritualist churches, they should throw out the Bibles. Well, I'm telling you, I hit the wall, I hit the ceiling. I was so upset with such a stupid thing. I got rid of him real quick. Hmm. because uh, to me the Bible is the greatest book of all dealing with psychic phenomena and uh, but this guy wanted to throw the Bible out see see it, it's and it's really in the Bible because if, if you look at the word psychic and go fi find out mm -hmm. its root form it comes from the Greek word psyche which means soul and mind the soul everybody's familiar with everyone realizes they have a soul uh, uh, St. Paul talked about the soul in, in the 15th chapter of the book of Corinthians where he says well, you have two, body, two bodies, a natural body or a physical body and a spiritual body. The spiritual body is the soul. We could also call it the psychic body because psychic means soul. Mm -hmm. So the soul body on death, when someone dies, the physical body gets, gets buried in the ground. The spiritual body or the psychic body goes on to live in the other dimension called called the spirit world or heaven. And when, uh, but, the, but we can call, say the psychic body is living in heaven too. We can use that term. It's not used that often, but it, we can. So when, it, when my grandmother died and, uh, and uh, she, uh, she eventually came back to, to speak with me through, through the medium, her, her, her spiritual body was in the other dimension, she, uh, our psychic body. When she came through to talk to Carl, when she showed him what she, what she was doing on the other side, that, was, that event was, was called a psychic phenomena because, because he's seeing her psychic body. Her spiritual body is, is a more usual term, or her soul. It can all be interchangeable. And, and this, this is why psychic phenomena is in the Bible. Okay. I would have to say to you honestly that growing up um, and, and just hearing the Bible referred to, the last thing that I would think of is, is that there is anything that has anything to do with psychic phenomena at all in the Bible. Well, I had the same reaction because mm -hmm. when I started Carl's classes in the 70s, I had been to the synagogue thousands of times and I heard all the Bible stories and I knew that, that God spoke to Abraham and God spoke to Moses and God spoke to Elijah and Elisha. And when I came here and found, and found out that, yes, he was saying the same thing. God spoke to him, but it was through the psychic gift of clairaudience. And it would have explained how it happened. See, in those days, when anyone spoke to a person who had the gift of clairaudience, and yet they look around and they didn't see a physical body, they always said, and the voice of the Lord spoke to me. They'd always address the person they couldn't see, but yet they could hear him as the Lord. You understand? And so through Christianity, they would always address the person as the Lord. But the average person would think the Lord, that meant it was Jesus talking to him. You have you to go see? back into biblical mm -hmm. times. We were very class conscious. And, anyone, and, and if someone of the lower class was speaking to someone of the higher mm -hmm. class, they called him the Lord or my Lord. 
and it's just like if, if you go into England today, they will say, we'll call the people who intend the House of Commons, my lord, my lordship. Mm -hmm. so, so because these people were seeing someone on a higher vibration, they knew they were more elevated than they were. They used that terminology, my lord. Your lordship. And, and the other piece that I understood, too, is if they weren't speaking to Jesus, they were speaking to God, who was Jesus' father. Right. So it was always directed to one person. And what you're saying is it just meant a sign of respect for whatever spirit yeah. entity yes, yes. they were talking yes. to. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. But you'll never hear me hmm. tell anyone, and I'm, I'm doing a reading or anything like the Lord just told me to tell you this. Hmm. You never hear me say this. No. Because everyone on the planet here has somebody, some relative, some ancestor that's already passed on. And oftentimes, if I see the person clairvoyantly, I will explain to them uh, what I'm seeing. And oftentimes they'll say, well, that was my grandfather, that was my grandmother. And oftentimes they will know it if it's a younger person. They'll say, you know, that, that, that was my older brother and that type of thing. Hmm. I'm not into trying to impress anybody okay. all because right. we all live, because it is the other body that is t discussed in Corinthians, that we're born with two bodies. It is the other body, the spirit body, that's going on and living in the other dimension. One body is buried in the ground if the person is buried. I do not recommend anybody having their relatives uh, cremated because you see, the spirit body, there are five, there are five bodies there that are really um, um, bodies of energy. Okay. Fire is energy. And there are five of the energy bodies that are destroyed with the energy of fire. Okay. And in the other dimension, there's only two of the bodies that are saved. And therefore, when some event is taking place in the other dimension, the, the burned people are the last ones called in and they go into the great ceremonies that they have there. They're called the burned people. And those that communicate with me tell me to tell people never, ever, ever have anybody cremated. Okay. And they say that that it's the worst thing you could ever do is to cremate the bodies. Thank you for that information. I hope that that does help Never some viewers. Never cremate the bodies because the body, the physical body is buried in the ground and the moment that death comes, the spirit body is separated and it goes to a, into a, one of the dimensions that it, that it planned and it created for itself. Mm. If it was a good person, it goes to one of the uh, better dimensions. If it was a bad person, it goes to where the other bad people know. It, it does not go to a place called hell. There's no such place as that. It simply goes to a dimension where other bad people go. Okay. And to tell the people there's no such place as hell, there's no such place as a, no such thing as a devil. That was created by the church thousands of years ago only to keep the people intact. Hmm. in check. Hmm. He said that was done by religion. Well, and the entities you. that have been in touch with me, they keep tenually tell me there's no such thing as the devil. If there was, God had to create it. That makes sense. That God created, if God created heaven and the earth and everything in between, right. then God would have had to create the devil. And if God created all of this and God gave you life and could take it away, why didn't God, why doesn't God zap that old bastard and get rid of him? Yeah. They've told me that many times. It makes no sense for him to create competition. It, right. It said, especially me, when he's supposed to be a jealous God. They said for, <laughs> for me to get people to think for themselves. Think for yourself. Because God is within yourself. And if the, if the people want something, they should say, Lord God of my being, unto the Father within, come forward come forward and help me to achieve this. And not to expect it that quick, but sooner or later, they will, it will manifest into their life. Ask him. Hmm. That's true. In, this, in the classes I've taught, 
many of the students have received it. Not instantly, but it did. Mm. That's true. Tina, going back to cremation, um, right. my father had four brothers. Uh, two, of the la two of them were cremated, the other three were not, but the other two of my father were not. I, I've heard from my father and his two brothers who were buried. I've never heard from the ones that have been cremated. Really? Really. I've never heard from them. And as, as recently as a few weeks ago, my, uh, my other two uncles came through, but not the ones that were, that Isn't were that cremated. Isn't something? Yes. It makes you wonder. And they were very close. Those five brothers were mm. extremely close. So if there was a way, they, they would be in contact. They'd be together on the other side. That's right. right. So I don't know if they are if they aren't, but, but they, they, they have never communicated with me, the ones that were mm. cremated. So if, if it, just getting back to the psychic phenomenon, if all of this is going on, and, and people are speaking to not one God, not Jesus specifically, but a whole bunch of entities in the spirit world, well, my goodness, that's psychic phenomena. And yes. the Bible has to be full of it. It is. Okay. It is full of it. See, you, the other thing that, that I should talk about, Tina, is the fact that when, when, you, when if you read the Bible in the Hebrew, there, there's a word called debar and devar. Um, and basically, when, it, when, it, when the Bible says, and God spoke to Moses, and God spoke to Abraham, that word devar is there. And what that word is, is a verb form for the word of oracle. An oracle is, in English is a place where, where psychic phenomena occurs where you hear the voice of God mm -hmm. or it's the person who brings it ac across. But there is no verb form of that. In Hebrew it exists. So instead of saying, and God spoke, it should say, and God oracly spoke or, clair or clairaudiently spoke to right. the people. Okay. or psychically spoke to this people. Okay. And that word is used thousands of times, at least 1,100 times in the Old Testament oh in, in Hebrew. So, so, and that none of that gets into English. It's like gone. It's similar to what I'm told that the Eskimos have, have about 11 words for snow, you know, because they, they have to know the different kinds of snow. Right. We just say snow. It's right. the same thing. This did not come across into our, our language, but yet it's, the information is there in the Hebrew. Now, can I also uh, clarify something here? Sure. That an entity by the name of Awan, mm -hmm. who, as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, uses Carl, uses Carl's body right. when Carl goes into trance. Awan is an acronym for angel okay. without a name. Thank you. Yes. It has conveyed a lot of this information yes. and sets you on a spin, if you will, mm -hmm. to go out and research Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of this. See, he, 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 Awan told me that the Bible had been changed, and coming from an Orthodox Jewish background, I... Uh, right, I, how I did that settle with you? Not very well, <laughs> you know? And it got to the point I was arguing and saying, well, maybe the Christian Bible was changed, but not the Jewish Bible, on and on. And eventually he challenged, you know, I was like Moses, because Moses argued with God that he didn't want to, want to be the spokesperson. He said, Get, find somebody else to do the speaking. <laughs> okay, but Awan, Awan didn't go that far. He, he just challenged me. He says, well, if, if you think that, that I'm wrong, Prove, me, prove that I'm wrong. Go out and, fi and find the information, and then we'll set up another appointment, and you can uh, come through, and we can talk about it again. And so I did that. And the more I researched, the more I found out he was right. I've never been able to disprove A1. Okay. No matter how outrageous a thing that I thought he said, it, it was always correct. Now, also in your first book, uh, My First Encounter with an Angel, Revelations of Ancient Wisdom, this book is all about instances of psychic phenomenon. Yes, it is. And exactly the f the, what you just said, that many of the Bibles have, in fact, changed and yes. been changed yes. of all the ones that you have researched. Yeah, uh, that, that book, I had researched 170 Bibles. I'm now up to 250. Really? Yeah. Okay. After these experiences with this entity called A1, I used to say to him, are you sure that's not Jesus? He says, no, it's not Jesus. It's somebody that won't even tell me who he was or anything. <laughs> and then there were several times that I came out of the trance. I was exhausted, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, he was mad. He was so angry at times. There was fire in his eyes, and he would be red in the face and everything else. And, I, you know, I really like to tell him, uh, tell him off. I was really angry at times, being tired. I was angry, yeah. and I, you know, I do have a temper a, a little bit, you know, southern <laughs> temper. Tell him to get the, you know, what out, mm -hmm. the building. And uh, so, uh, because here's uh, somebody that's in denial, and I'm tired, right. using all of my energy. And cause to me, I kept thinking, with all that information, got to be him, and he says it's not him. 
and it didn't make sense because all this heavy stuff, I thought it's got to be him. Right. And to me, I don't know who that is and, and everything else. And so he finally came back and he says, no, it's not him. I don't know who it is, but I can't find any proof. I can't find any, uh, any proof that I'm, everything I'm finding, it's true. Whatever he's saying, it's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, mm -hmm. I can't find anything that proves that he's Basically. wrong. Never Everything had, I find had. is right. He's right. He's and, right. And maybe our culture has also been taught that the only person who's capable of this wisdom and this knowledge of everything and, and at all times was Jesus, when in fact he was, but that would, that would assume that there weren't any other people who had knowledge mm -hmm. and who have passed to the other dimension who could share that with you as well. But he would come in and find out that the Jewish Bible had been changed. That was it. And it was almost as if it was my fault it was being changed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was as if it was my fault. <laughs> you know, that was when I would really get <laughs> upset. You know, as if I'm telling him, right. you know, it's my fault it's been changed. Now, speaking of telling people what has changed and what has happened, uh, the title of this show, uh, The Gifts of Prophecy, makes me wonder just how, um, Sidney, you having been exposed to Carl with some of the things he was also telling you maybe about your personal life or about other people or other things that he, he, that he uh, sees, um, how, how that struck you, how you were with that as well. Never mind just the Bible changing. Right. Well, well, the, th the thing was that um, after a while, I started to, un started to understand things, and I came across uh, so many religious rituals that had psychic, psychic meaning to them, yet the psychic meaning was gone, but they're still doing the rituals. And uh, so there was a lot of empty ceremonies that, that I started to kind of break away from Judaism somewhat mm -hmm. because I was understanding the Bible better, and seeing that these these rituals were man-made and it really aren't weren't didn't have the significance they were supposed to have because they weren't carrying out the psychic phenomena that went along with the ritual. Hmm. So I was sitting in the in the synagogue uh, one one um, uh, New Year's uh, for Rosh Hashanah where they take out the, a ram's horn and they blow it, and and uh, they sound they sound make this sound in a certain rhythm you know, and uh, that's where the holiday gets gets its name from, and. Um, so, and I knew it was supposed to be a, a trumpet, a medium's trumpet. A medium's trumpet is a, is a long cone. It's like an aluminum cone that's uh, may, maybe as high as from here to the floor. And um, the spirit people take ectoplasm, which is a part of the, part of the cells, make a voice box, and spirit can freak, speak through it. And at the end of my first encounter, I actually had to write about when I had a chance to speak to my father two years after he died, mm -hmm. and that was him. And that's what the trumpet was all about. And then if you read, if you read uh, Exodus chapter 19, it talks about the voice coming through the trumpet and giving the, the, the Hebrews the Ten Commandments. So this was a way, a, a way, the, one of the few ways that spirit, the spirit people can actually talk to physical people with, without, without coming, it comes through the medium, the medium has to be present, but, they, but you hear it with your ears. It's not, it's not the spirit people talking to the medium and the medium repeating it to you. Okay. You can hear it with your own ears. So right. it's, it's like a telephone call to the spirit world. And uh, I'm sitting there understanding this, although I hadn't witnessed it at this point, and I'm holding, I'm holding my prayer book in my hand, reading this and thinking about it, and all of a sudden the pages turn on its own, and I'm, I'm, I look at the bottom there, and there's a little footnote, and it said, and it says, in, in biblical times, the trumpet, the, the shofar that they, that they sound was, it, was, was made out of silver, and a medium's trumpet has to be made out of metal, and I looked at that. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice, which for me doesn't happen too often, and it just said, "The curse of ignorance." Huh? Because I was look, I was looking at this thing, and it, it was because I was experiencing all these empty rituals and a feeling so empty, looking at that and right. seeing the evidence of the psychic right. phenomena, and then that voice came through. "The curse of ignorance" is, is a title of a book that Arthur Finley wrote, and it's all it's a history of psychic phenomena, and. I was so upset with everything that had happened that holiday had taken place on a Thursday and Friday. Mm -hmm. And Saturday, the high holiday was over, but it was the Sabbath. And my grandmother kept it just like the, the holiday, but I had enough. And I got on the subway and I went, I went into Manhattan because my grandmother was living in Brooklyn. I went to a psychic bookstore called Weiser's. 
and I walked into there, and lo and behold, on the shelf was The Curse of Ignorance, and oh. that book was extremely hard to find in those days. It since has been reprinted, but in those days it wasn't, and you could not find it because so many copies have been destroyed by a certain religious organization. Really? And, uh, and there it was, and I just, you know, it was just a very powerful experience for me. So slowly all these things are unfolding yes. for you. Yes, okay. but lo long before uh, he crossed my path, a minister from Massachusetts by the name of uh, uh, Reverend Bingham, he uh, called me up one day and uh, identified himself, wanted to know if I was so-and-so, and I said, yeah. And he wanted to know how to, where I lived, and he wanted to drive down. He had a present from London, England. And the uh, story was this. He went to London, England to study under Harry Edwards, which was a, a great healer, and uh, he was on, always on calls for the, the uh, Queen of, of England. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, he, he was very famous, this man, Harry Edwards, was very famous. And while my friend, um, uh, Reverend Bingham, was there, an elderly minister came up to him and he says, you are from the States? And he said, yes. He says, you live in New England? Yes. He said, have you ever heard of a man uh, by the name of Carl Hewitt? He says, no, I haven't. He says, I believe you'll find him living in uh, Connecticut. And he says, I want you to take this book back with you. Take it to him. You'll find him somewhere in Connecticut. He says, I don't know where he is, but you will find him there. And he says, um, those in the higher dimensions want this book put in his hands. And uh, it was, the book was, the name of the book was uh, The Psychic Stream, hmm. also written by um, Arthur, Finley. Arthur Finley. Really? <laughs> and it's about that thick. Ooh. Psychic Stream was a book, one of his first books, and uh, it, it was about the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the psychic stream. In the beginning, it was like a river that was above ground. Everybody could see it, but religion eventually ran it underground so nobody could see it. Mm. It was the truth of psychic phenomena but the church ran it underground so nobody could see it. They is, wanted to hide it. They is, did not want people to understand it. This is why sometimes it's called the occult. That's right. occult means hidden. That's and this, right. this truth was, oh. was, was hidden to, from people. Okay. When Arthur Finley died in 1964, I believe, yes. mm -hmm. the biggest, one of the biggest parties ever held at the Vatican was held that day. I don't know who was Pope at the time, but they celebrated his death because his books were bought and burned all over the world up until that time. Really? Yeah. You would think that if this man posed no threat to them, because I'm assuming this is what you're referring to with yes. him, that they wouldn't put all this energy into book burnings and celebrations. But because you have now told me that, then I'm understanding that he may have had something that they probably didn't want other people to hear. Exactly. The, the man that sent me the book by Reverend Bingham mm. told Reverend Bingham, whatever you do, don't let this book be put in anybody's hands except Carl Hewitt. Bingham didn't even know me. Hmm. I didn't know Bingham. Bingham and his wife drove all the way down to Connecticut here and put it in my hands. And then from that day on, Bingham and I became the best of friends. Wow. And every time that there was a seance that I went to after Bingham died, Seant, I mean, Bingham comes through, as you know, and mm -hmm. writes his name on the biggest cards. Right. Uh, right. For instance, this card right here, if you look right down here, notice his name. Isn't that his name right here, Bingham? Yes, this yes. is Reverend Bingham in red. Reverend Bingham right I don't right think our there. viewers can see that, but that if, is the card, the front the card, of the card. Yes. If, if the camera could move in, we did, we did that one night, one night here. 
I don't think we can right now unless you, you want to hold it up. I don't know if you can or not, but I'll take up. a shot at it right okay. here. Okay, we'll try for that. It's, it's right here. Don't forget that the original of this picture is a 3 by 5 card. And there it is. Go there ahead. it is. Hold it. Move it's your finger right, up it. It's yep. right here. Bingham. Reverend Bingham in red on and the left. He comes, he comes through from the Spirit and writes his name <laughs> bigger than anybody else's. I yeah, see that. Yeah, you're right. Can and you in red. See it? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think our viewers can see that very well. Yes. And this is the back of the card right. that you see here. The card has been enlarged for you to see the details of the picture better, but the back of the card is actually, I think that's the true size, isn't it? Yes, that's of the Of the index size. card yes. Yes. where the signatures are. That's and great. The picture appears on the card. The picture is not done by any human hands. It's all done by spirit. This is known as precipitated uh, art. Mm -hmm. This is done by precipitated writing mm. here. This is one of the gifts of the Spirit. It is not listed in the Bible. This is something they have developed in the last 300 years. Okay. The, greatest, the greatest gifted people that we have, a, have any record of would be the two sisters in Chicago by the name of the Bang Sisters. Okay. And I would like to just mention uh, while we're talking about them, if in those days that were back in the 90s, uh, 1890s, if you, uh, uh, you people, anybody out there, if you ever could have come and got a reading by those two ladies, one would sit like where Sydney is sitting, the other one was sitting where uh, Tina is sitting. And they'd take a canvas and hold it between them. The canvas would be bigger than this, obviously. Right between the two ladies would be a stack of canvases and you would sit right over there and the both of them would give you a reading and both of them would be talking but never interrupting each other and as they were talking about halfway through the reading they would both reach down here without saying uh, without looking and they would pick up a canvas just as he picked up the book right. and, and you would be like looking this. at this canvas and it would be just like this is a big huge Polaroid picture and you would be looking here and slowly this picture would develop right in front of your eyes of the person that is passed on would appear on this canvas and that would be yours to take home with you and it would be the picture of the person your relative that has come back and given you the reading talking through these two women wow that's 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 something that people have to witness. Phenomena beyond mm. anything. A lot of people would never believe it. But today, those pictures are in the museum in Chesterfield, Indiana. Yeah, Thank you. have 25 of them. I Tina. know. There's so much jealousy going on in that camp today, I'm ashamed of what's going on there. Oh. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, since, it's, since the show's about prophecy, um, maybe Carl would like to talk about the, pro the prophecy he had from Catherine Margiotti de dealing with me. Well, I wanted to ask you this first. You keep talking about gifts of the Spirit. What does that have to do with you? What does that have to do with your church? And how is gifts of prophecy connected? I've been dying to put all these together mm -hmm. and then throw them at you. It would take us longer than this uh, program. <laughs> okay. Like this. Okay. All right. <laughs> years ago, I would say this is 25 or 30 years ago, I was told, I still say it was him that told me, he said that the day would come that we would be uh, we, that we would be seen in the on the screens television screens in the homes of people, and that there would be a beautiful uh, that there would be the face of a beautiful lady. This is the lady mm -hmm. here, uh, and another man, and that would be a Hebrew. It's him, oh. not so pretty. Okay, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, because you see the other dimension people uh, is timeless absolutely timeless whereas we live in a time flow here it's timeless so they don't have clocks time X's and all of that and uh, they have to worry about time and so that that they told me has come to pass and so uh, the thing that they've urged me to do gently urged me to do is to urge me to get people to think for themselves. Think for themselves. Because they've, they've told me to urge, the, uh, remind the people that we have a mind and that we have a soul, we have a brain. 
as to use it. And uh, in the last uh, seven or eight years, they have reminded me that, that we have come to a point, civilization has come to a point that the maximum amount of the human brain on this planet, maximum amount, and it's only a few people, that use only one third of the brain, maximum. And that there are some babies now being born using up to 60%, but no more than that. And there's a little boy that has been on television several times on the, uh, what's her name? That Oprah black? Show. Oprah Show. That his name, I think, is uh, Jeff Smith. Jeff Smith, hmm. that is using 95% of his brain, that little blonde kid. And he uses 95% of his brain. That there are others that are born are using from 60% up to 90% of their brain. And uh, it's because we have, we're not utilizing the brain as it should be because we're depending on other people doing the thinking for us. It's as simple as that. Awan explained to us that, that the 95% of the brain we're not using would be the centers to do the gifts of the Spirit. And since churches were successful in taking gifts of the Spirit out of the churches yeah. and driving it underground, mm. all that part of the brain is at atrophied and that's why we don't use it. But, but if, for example, right behind a person's ears there's some bumps, and it, behind those bumps is, is a center, would, if those cells are working, you'd be clairaudient, you'd be able to hear the voices of spirit. But, but for most people it's closed. For Reverend Hewitt's, they're open. Um, but uh, so the, all that brain is, 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 because these churches got people to believe that it was the work of the devil and made them fearful to, to practice the gifts of the spirit, it's genetically now passed down from, from person to person as being closed, except in families where there are some gifts, some people who have, have some psychic gifts or have some gifts of the spirit, it travels down the family genetically. And that's, that's, so some of those brain centers tend to be open. You know, I, I also had heard with respect to gifts of the spirit in your church, um, and you were talking about someone's reaction to spiritualist churches before. Mm -hmm. I'd heard that when you in fact were ordering Bibles, we're trying to talk about yes. psychic phenomena in the Bibles, that the, um, maybe you could fill in the gap right on here. this. They, they didn't want to sell you the Bibles? No. This particular Bible here, at the beginning, I wanted to order this Bible, American Bible, mm -hmm. and I called this place in Michigan. It's called the, the company Zondervan. Zondervan uh, to order Bibles. Mm -hmm. And of course, this woman wanted to know, you know, what's the name of the church? And I said, it's going to be Gifts of the Spirit Church. And she says, that's the work of the devil, and she slammed the receiver down. Really? Yes. Absolutely. And I called another company, and it's the same thing. And yet, that's absolute ignorance. And yet, if you read the Bible carefully, the Beck Bible in 1976 says, "Fellow Christians, I want you educated in the gifts of the Spirit." Right. The word "gifts of the Spirit" is in one, the twelfth, first one, uh, the twelfth chapter of Corinthians in most Bibles. Some of them says spiritual gifts, but others say gifts of the Spirit, that exact word. And it goes on to list what all the gifts of the Spirit are, prophecy and speaking in tongues and on and on and on. And that definitely came, was written down by St. Paul, if they want to call him a saint. Mm -hmm. And he, he was talking, he was a medium who was listening to Jesus, and Jesus was talking to him and telling him what, what, to, what to teach the people. And that's definitely part, part of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So why any Christian group would say that the, the gifts of the Spirit are of the devil, I don't understand. Well, and, and then you had mentioned earlier that they were doing prophecy in the church yes. in the earlier days. Yes, sure. And so how is it now that now that's not something acceptable? Be because in, in they, they took it out and they stopped it. In, in the 14th chapter of, of, uh, of, Cor of the book of Corinthians, it reads in verse 2 of chapter 14, for one who speaks in tongues does not speak to men but to God. Speaking in tongues means the person goes into trance and begins speaking another language. For example, if I was to go into to trance and start speaking Japanese, which I can't speak a word of, you would know that somebody, other spirits in mm -hmm. me working my body. Mm -hmm. that's, spirit, that's the gift of tongues. However, if nobody in the room can speak Japanese, it's a total waste of time right. because nobody can understand the message. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it goes on there, for, for no one understands, but it is his spirit that speaks to the mysteries. Um, 
it says in verse 5, I wish that all of you spoke in tongues, but even more, that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so the church may receive edifying. So St. Paul saying the prophet is, is mm. key. The early Christian churches, they went into the church. There wasn't a priest standing up there. There was a medium. And the medium was giving a sermon because he was in communi the, the, the medium could have been male or female. Mm -hmm. And he or she was in, in communion with, with the spirit. The spirit was working through them, mm -hmm. either in trance or a light trance, which is called inspirational speaking. And, and, the, and the message of spirit was coming forth and people would go to the church. That was Christianity up into the third century. But what happened was that Jerome start, start, wanted to get rid of the mediums because they wanted to change all the doctrines. They wanted the priests to be in charge. And therefore, they, they decided at a, count, at, a, at a certain council, to, to, at the Council of Carthage in 397, the church announced that inspiration, automatic writing, prophecy, uh, ceased with the apostles. So in other words, nobody else but, but the apostles, Jesus' disciples, could do that. And that all inspiration now rested in the church, which was guided by the Holy Spirit to interpret the scriptures as God intended them to be understood. So you were no longer allowed to read the Bible yourself. You had yeah. to listen to the way the priest did it. The quote I just read from you, again, is from Arthur Finley. Isn't that something? Yes. So now I had heard, with respect to prophecy, that this isn't something that's only reserved just for biblical times, that Carl himself has made prophecies or predicted things. Yes. And I understand that he's done that both in his personal life and also with a, a business partner. I had read something here about that. I don't know if Carl wanted to share some of those examples with us. Which one do you suggest you've got a better memory about this <laughs> stuff than I have? Well, for, first of all, uh, this business associate was, was very close-minded when it came to this work. Okay. And um, oh, yeah. they, 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 the spirit people set out to kind of prove things to him. Okay, this, this particular person uh, was, uh, I don't know why spirit brought this person across my path. Yeah. He was the closest, close-mindedest person I've ever known in my life. As I, you know, I've said he's it was Catholic as the Pope. Okay. <laughs> really, Catholic as the Pope, and I never discussed religion. Mm. Never. Mm. But one time, I stopped at his. I stopped at the house and uh, and uh, his house and his brother. One of his brothers had stopped by his, and his wife, and they're on their way to. Uh, they were back on their way to Kentucky. That's okay. where they live. Okay. And um, he was there just for a few minutes, you know, before he left and everything else. Of course, his brother's, his sister-in-law was from the South, you know, with that Southern accent and everything else. And I'm from the South, so we hit it off pretty good. Mm -hmm. So they, they drove away, and I said uh, to him, I said, is your brother there? Um, did he say anything to you about having um, liver cancer? Hmm. No, he hasn't got liver cancer. What's the matter with you? I says, well, he's got liver cancer. He says, how do you know? I says, he's got liver cancer. I he says, I hate to tell you this, but I says, he's going to pass away next October. Hmm. No, next August. Hmm. How do you know this? I said, Spirit just told me. What do you mean, Spirit just told you? I said, Spirit just told me. Oh, don't talk to me about those little things. And then he described Spirit as if they're like flies. Okay. I said, oh my, I said to myself, oh my God, I've said that to the wrong person. <laughs> you know, like a bunch of bees, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I was, I was really giving myself hell for saying such a thing in, you know, his presence. Yeah. And um, so I didn't say anything because mm. I'd already said, you're going to pass next August. So. It was about two months later, I happened to stop by there with some papers because he and I had invested in some land or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
and sure enough, they were on their way again. I don't know why uh, it just happened again. They were on their way either going north or south again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, um, again, they were leaving one way or another. And I said, he's, uh, you don't look too good, your brother, though. No. And I don't know why I opened my big mouth. <laughs> And uh, he left, and I said, your brother don't look too good. And he didn't seem to be too happy because I said that. And so it was two or three days later, I stopped by to bring in some additional papers, and the phone rang, and by God, that was his brother again. And. He sat down on a chair while he was talking to him on the phone, just staring at me. And then he said, after the phone call, he says, what else did you, what else do you see about my brother? I said, why? He said, he's got cancer of the liver. I felt like saying, yeah, what else is new? But I, if, I'm not gonna go any further mm, with that. Right, right. I says, he's gonna die the 14th of August. Oh my. 11.20 in the morning. So the, the, year, the year went by, and then in July came by around, and I said, he was talking to me, he says, I just got a phone call from my sister in Kentucky, and I said, uh, she, he said, she said, he's very sick. I said, you better go see him, he's gonna die on the 14th of August. Really? So he flew down to see him, and he died the 14th of August at 20 minutes after 11 You are kidding me. It's the truth. And that was when he shaved his brother and he died at 20 minutes after 11, right on the minute. And he told his sisters that about a week before that. And you know what they said? That was a guess. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, from what I've heard, <laughs> and what I hope we can get into, and if we don't get into all of it in this show, I think we're going to have a part two of this Gifts mm -hmm. of Prophecy. Um, this is not the only time. It appears that there have been many, many other times where you have just guessed you and, guess, and yeah. predicted some pretty big things, too. Yes. I mean, big in terms of affecting a large amount, uh, group of people. As far, as far as this particular person was going, uh, as concerned, not only did Carl predict the brother's death. He also did the father and the mother, and he was right on each of the days. Really, and this this is very unusual because usually mediums cannot when they doing when they're doing predictions mm -hmm. they don't pinpoint days and specific times for sure. Right. One of the things that that we we like to what well, like to teach is that what it happens in, bi in biblical times can ha still happen today. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to read you a short quote from the Bible Please. dealing with the same type mm -hmm. of prophecy. It deals with Elisha. And uh, Elisha's, um, this is in the second book of Kings, uh, ver, uh, chapter 4, verse 15. And he, Elisha, called, said, call her. And, and the, his servant Gehazi called her, and she stood in the doorway. Then Elijah said, at this season next year, you shall embrace the son. This woman didn't, was, didn't, hadn't had a baby yet, and she was very concerned about that. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservants. She couldn't believe that she would, she would have a child because she had been trying for such a long time mm. and, and it was unsuccessful. And the woman conceived and bore a son in that season the next year, as Elisha had told her. The same verse in, verse in the Coverdale Bible says, and he said, about this time, if the fruit can live. In other words, mediums usually don't say March, this is going to happen March 15th at 11 o'clock. What they usually do is give a time frame or a season. Mm. And when it says, the, and the fruit can live, which would indicate probably the springtime or something like, something like that. And that's the way it usually works. Carl had the same exact experience with a, some friends of mine who were also having trouble conceiving. Really? Yes, and they came, they came to see, for a reading and, she, and uh, she was speaking to Carl and Carl said, you know, ne by next year you will have twins. Or, or in two years, I forget if it was a year or two years. And the prediction came out true, but she was so incensed. He thought it was being ins insensitive because she was having problems conceiving and stuff that she got very aggravated about she it. She bowled me out. But she did have twins. Really? They needed, uh, they needed some help, <laughs> you know, with our, they needed some help with artificial right. insemination and stuff, but it came about. Well, you would think that with, with news like that of something that someone wants to know about 
that, that would be welcome if they'd heard it, that they would appreciate it, as opposed to finding out that somebody's mm -hmm. going to die of liver cancer. Right. I mean, I can, I can right. try to see both sides of that, if the family would react to that, to be saddened by that. Or perhaps they could use that information my to friend, a positive My extent. friend Bonnie that I write about in the book, who is, she's, it was through her that I mm. met Carl. We used to attend psychic development classes together. And one day we came into class and Carl takes a look at her and says, oh, congratulations, you're pregnant. Well, she didn't know that yet. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so a few months later, she went to him, uh, tell me when, what, what the sex of the baby is going to be and tell me when it's going to be born. And he says, I see a paper, it's going to be a girl, and I see a paper that has August 26th on it. Well, lo and behold, August 23rd came along and, the, and, and Jennifer was born. So Bonnie was a bit confused a little bit later, but then when she was, after she spent a couple of days in the hospital and she was given the release papers, it was dated August 26th. So he had seen the oh, release papers and goodness. not the birth certificate. Oh, my goodness. So this is the way it works sometimes. So sometimes when they're right, when mediums are a little bit wrong, they're still right. Right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten wonderful letters from people, but that lady he was talking about, this couple in New Jersey, uh, she bawled me out that day. She <laughs> bawled me out. She called me everything under the sun. Uh, you know, just, uh, but she had two right. identical twin right, boys. Right. So it turned out there wasn't anything to fear no. with respect to Carl sharing this information. No. And there really isn't anything for anyone to fear when, when somebody has this gift that you have. So, and they didn't seem to fear some of the people in the Bible. No, no, the, pe the they people. They seem to respect and revere them. That's right, and, and, they, and, they, and they seem to want to know. I've heard so many people say to me, oh, I'd never go to a medium. I don't know what's going to happen in my life. I don't want right. to know what's going to happen in my life. Right. I find that it prepares one for, for, for problems. Right. It, it's not something to be fearful of. I mean, it just appears that they've been brainwashed for so many thousands of years into believing that it's something evil. Yes. And it really just means it's something they don't know about. Mm -hmm. And once they become familiar with it, i.e. making known the unknown, <laughs> that's why we're doing the show, you can see that you can, you can be in this world and, and be a part of this and understand that this is how it works and not be afraid of it. It could actually help you. And, and what I'm going to hope to do is in our next show, if you will uh, uh, consider this, and we can continue to talk about the gifts of prophecy and sure. psychic phenomena in the Bible. Sure. And I would be honored if the two of you would return to talk about that. I gladly will. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is wrap up today's show. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to remind our viewers again, and I'll keep reminding you, you want to open your minds, start with this book. My First Encounter with an Angel, Revelations of Ancient Wisdom. It will blow you away. It reads a little bit like a textbook, but that's okay because you're learning something. This isn't a song and dance. Um, this isn't a love story. This is the truth. And it might be a little painful to take, but you'll do it. You'll open your mind. We have hope. And we also have an email address, making underscore known at yahoo.com. For anybody who has any questions or suggestions for other topics of show, we definitely will keep it open for that. And with that, I want to say a gracious thank you to Sydney Schwartz. You're welcome. And Reverend Carl Hewitt. You're welcome. And thank you, viewers. Until next time.